Just while they're going out, uh, my name's Guy Feldman. For those that we haven't met yet, I'm one of the elders here. And just so excited with all that's going on. Such a privilege to be part of that. Let's pray together as we go into the Word. Lord, we thank you for what you are doing and for what you want to do. And you are welcome here, Holy Spirit. Make the Word alive to us this morning. May your presence be tangible and real. We hand over to you now, Lord. Just say our hearts are open to what you're saying. In Jesus' name, amen. We started a series last week, a four-week series on the supernatural. Alan Parfit kicked it off for us. It was a great intro, and uh, I'm doing the second one today. And I want to start by um, just giving a little bit of, a, of some feedback of what celebrity, some celebrities have said about the supernatural. The supernatural is such, a, such an out there thing at the moment. There's different opinions around the supernatural. But listen to what some, some of the celebrities have said in response to the supernatural. Actor Vin Diesel is convinced that all creative people believe in the supernatural. The American Muscle Man co-stars with Elijah Wood in The Last Witch Hunter, a movie about the forces of good and evil and mystical creatures. He's sure that there's more to life than science and thinks people with an arty streak all feel the same. And the mystical beliefs don't stop there. The star is also very superstitious and completes certain rituals regularly. I knock on wood and cross myself before getting on a plane, he continued. I've, I love ghost stories since childhood, and I do believe in them, Elijah said. All that energy in our lives can't just disappear when we die. Death is not the end, but I'm not exactly sure what lies on the other side. What about Miley Cyrus? During a trip to London, Cyrus stayed at an, at an apartment that used to be an old bakery. I was having really crazy dreams and real scary things, she told L.U.K., one night, her little sister started screaming while in the shower. I ran in there and the water had somehow flipped to hot. It wasn't like the water had just changed. The knob had turned, but she hadn't turned it, and it was burning her. She was really red. Miley also claims to have seen a small boy sitting on the sink watching me take a shower. It's strange. Lady Gaga, in 2010, Gaga's crew said she was freaked out because a ghost named Ryan was following her. I said to the first guys in the first service, hopefully that wasn't my boy. <laughs> She's pretty terrified by the spirit, but more than anything, he's annoying her as he won't leave her alone, they told reporters. Gaga held a seance, um, where are we? seance in Belfast to try and get rid of him. She reportedly dropped $47,000 on ghost finding equipment. No word on whether Ryan was successfully busted. There's so much around this thing of the supernatural. Some people are for it, some are against it. In fact, even Christians' response to the concept of the supernatural is divided. If I had to ask you in this room who believes in what, there would be all sorts of different responses. They could be as follows. Weird. Non-existent. The supernatural is just non-existent. Or the no-entry zone. Or exciting. Convincing. Some people say the supernatural is necessary. We're talking now as believers with regards to the supernatural of God. Some Christians say, leave it alone. I have a friend who leads a church. In fact, he doesn't anymore. He's recently handed over. But he had an, an experience a little while ago where just some things went down around prophecy that confused him and um, just put a bit of a bad taste in his, in his mouth. And rather than dealing with it, he just made this general statement. He said, I don't want that stuff anymore. Just give me the word. You know, anything that's kind of supernatural or spiritual, I don't want that in my services. I just want the word, the word, the word. And I challenged him. I said, the word without the spirit will bring death into your meetings. You take the supernatural of God out of the Bible and you'll just have a text You'll just have history. There'll be no life. And so there's differences of opinions when it comes to the supernatural of God. Some people pray for it. Some people think it's crazy. Some think it's demonic. And some long for it. Where do you stand? Have you had some experiences in the past that have caused 
the supernatural, these supernatural things. Maybe you're just really nervous of it. I think even in, in Christianity, there's been some strange stuff that's happened in the name of God, you know, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Really weird stuff. You know, they're spraying on of doom while praying for each other and snakes in meetings. Honestly, guys in worship holding snakes and, and bringing that into their worship meetings in the name of Jesus. It's like, it's just weird. And rather than dealing with it and, and, and you know, settling what's of God and what's not, we just paint it often with a certain brush and say, the supernatural is just not for me. I just want the Word. And we do need the Word, but we also need the Spirit, don't we? Some biblical terminology for the word supernatural. The word supernatural actually is not in the Bible, but the concept is. And the more biblical terminology for supernatural would be things like signs and wonders. That's a biblical terminology for what we're talking about. Or gifts of the Holy Spirit found in 1 Corinthians 12. Or the Holy Spirit coming upon people. Or the concept of being spirit, spiritual or spirit. In John 4.24, we read that God is spirit. <laughs> if God is spirit, then He's spiritual. And if God is spiritual, then the spiritual world we should be open to in the right way. Does that make sense? In John 4.24, God is spirit and His worshippers must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Romans 8.5 says, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. There's so many examples in the Bible of the concept of the supernatural, or as I've just mentioned now, spiritual things happening. Here's a few. Remember when Peter along with some other guys, observed Jesus being transformed on the mountain of transfiguration, where his face just became brilliantly white and his clothing just became this perfectly um, electric white and they were actually afraid. But what about Jesus walking on the water in Matthew 14, 22 to 23? Or Jacob having the dream with angels ascending and descending on a ladder from heaven in Genesis 28? Or Moses experiencing a bush that was on fire but didn't burn up. These are all supernatural or spiritual things that happen in the Bible. That story is found in Exodus 3.1. Or Paul, who himself went to the third heaven in 2 Corinthians 12, 2-4. I mean, that could really mess with your mind. These things are real. And I would like to suggest today, as we talk about God being spirit and being a God full of power, that we need to differentiate the, the things of the world from the godly things. Alan spoke about Abram and Sarah last week around this concept of, of the supernatural. I'd like to talk a little bit about Peter, because he was a man who walked in the supernatural. And if you could turn with me to Acts chapter 3, please, verse 1 to 10. I want to look at some of his experiences with regards to the power of the Lord or the supernatural. You remember that Peter had didn't end so well before Jesus died. Went through all sorts of shame because he denied him and made a few mistakes on the way. This is Acts chapter 3. It's at the beginning of Acts where suddenly Jesus reinstates him on the beach, remember, over a fish bra in John 21, gives him courage again, sends him out. Pentecost comes in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 3, three chapters into Acts, the same Peter who was in a bit of a state when Jesus died, now has the strength and courage. And this is what happens in verse 1 of Acts 3. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. At three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful. Interesting, this man had never walked before. He had never had the experience or the privilege of being able to put one foot in front of another. 
he was carried everywhere or perhaps got around some other way, but that was his experience. He was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. Verse 3, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him. You can see the confidence that's come upon Peter now, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Now again, if we leave the supernatural out of our lives, or out of our belief system as Christians, then what happened after that, we would disqualify. We would refer to this as a myth or a Bible story that wasn't true. It's just a nice story to encourage us. But this happened because we know that what's in the Bible is truth. He looks at this man who had never in his life walked before, and he says to him, walk. That offends the mind because a crippled man should not walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. Can you imagine what that scene must have looked like? He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple, called, temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This was Peter's experience. Jesus had gone. We can kind of accept the fact that Jesus walked in the supernatural because he was, after all, the Son of God. But now that same gift had been passed on to the disciples. And Peter himself has this amazing encounter where the power from heaven comes upon him. And he just says one word, walk. And as he looks at this man, he grabs his hand and he lifts him up. And his ankles literally became strong in front of their eyes. Two chapters further, in Acts chapter 5, we see more of this activity in the book of Acts and how this starts to become the norm of the apostles. And we see in verse 12 to 16 of Acts chapter 5, the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. That would be the equivalent of saying there was much supernatural activity amongst the church or in the church. And some people say, oh God, there we go. The apostles performed many signs and wonders and miracles. So that's just the apostles of that day, you know. Or maybe apostles now. Only apostles can do this. The Bible doesn't support that theory. We see in Mark 16, Jesus parting words, he says to everyone, to all of us, to all who believe, go into all the world, preach the gospel, and these signs will follow those who believe, not just apostles, but all who believe. And then he lists a whole bunch of signs that should happen today and can happen today in the church. All the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. Verse 13, no one else dared join them even though they were highly regarded by the people. So interesting. No one wanted to join the church. Why? Because God was there. Sometimes I think we have our services without the Lord. It's a big statement to make, but in our minds, I think sometimes we're just happy with a couple of worship songs, a word, and then coffee and go home and you know, fill our tanks, get us ready for the rest of the week. But it was different in this context. The disciples or the people around the church were nervous of the church. Things happened in the church. People died in the church. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? Demons were cast out in church services. Miracles happened. God was there. People encountered the living God in church. And I'd like to suggest that more and more that should happen in our meetings. Don't you agree? So it says in verse 13, no one else dared join them because they were afraid. But verse 14, nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. It's almost a contradiction. No one dared join them, but a whole bunch of people did join them. And what he's basically saying is there, it wasn't a place for casual observers. 
those who did join the church were really serious about God. Verse 15, as a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered from towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. This was the activity of the church. If you look at my shadow on the stage, that's exactly what happened. People, it seemed like people would kind of, wherever Peter went, he would walk down the street, and they would take sick people on mats, and they would kind of assume where he was going to walk and put them down there, and as his shadow touched them, they were healed. This is not some weird concept, like some of these stories we heard from celebrities, some strange fantasy out there, ghosts and the weird, weird and wonderful world of the supernatural. That was their life. That was reality for those early Christians. Some people say, oh, I'm not interested in the supernatural you know that Jesus' roots were birthed in the supernatural? His conception was not a natural one. His mom was not intimate with a man in order for him to be conceived. It was a supernatural one. Even his death was a supernatural death. He died, and three days later, there was supernatural activity that caused him to go to ascend into heaven. We can't take these concepts out of our faith. I want to just share practically around some aspects of the spiritual realm or the supernatural, some comments around this. Here's a couple of points. Number one, the spiritual realm or the supernatural is to be celebrated and is to be desired. Once we begin to believe this and pursue it and open ourselves to it, when we see people getting healed and when we see people getting freed from demons and when we see broken homes starting to get healed because God's power comes upon them, we actually begin to celebrate it and we actually begin to long for it. You see that in 1 Corinthians 14.1, Paul says to the Corinthian church, follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. Long for them to be in your meetings, especially prophecy. I mentioned just now Mark 16, 17, and 18. These signs will accompany those who believe they will cast out demons, speak in new tongues, etc. The spiritual realm is to be celebrated and is to be desired. I understand that some people have got really confused by some activity that's gone down in the church like I mentioned earlier in the name of God or in the name of the Holy Spirit but we need to get over that we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater, as it were if this is in the Bible it's something we need to allow ourselves to embrace number two about the spiritual realm we cannot hide behind ignorance we can't say, well, I don't really understand that stuff, so I'll leave it to the professionals, those guys who do this more than I do. Paul warns against that in 1 Corinthians 12. 1. He says, about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. In other words, it's not an excuse to say, I don't get that stuff, so I'll just carry on with life. So long as it's me and Jesus, I don't need anything more than that. No, actually, Paul says, don't be uninformed. Make it your business to find out what God wants to do in and through the life of a believer. I say this so often and I believe it with my heart. The church needs to become dangerous again in a good way. As believers, we need to become dangerous, red hot for God. When the world encounters the church, there should be a reaction. You know, not just, oh, there's another believer, those weird people. Number three, the supernatural, simply put, is God partnering with His people. That's what it is. It's God's world invading our world. And I kind of say, bring it on, Lord. I want your world to be part of mine. And fourthly, another comment about the spiritual realm 
it's abnormal not to walk in power as a believer. It doesn't line up with the Scriptures when we eliminate that part of our faith from our reality. A gospel without power is half a gospel. If you can put those bullet points up as well for us there, Dylan. Thanks. A gospel without power is half a gospel. It's not a supernatural lifestyle per se that we're after. It's a Jesus lifestyle because that's how he lived. It's his lifestyle. And God is to be experienced. It's not an intellectual Christianity or a scientific belief that we have. God is to be experienced. We were born with this inner ear to hear him. It's more normal to hear God than not to hear God because that's how we were designed. We were designed with this, sis, this computer system, in inverted commas, this mindset, this ability to hear, to pick, up, to pick up the sounds of heaven. Jesus himself had spiritual encounters. Remember at his baptism? I mean, the beginning, the launch of his ministry came with the supernatural, the spiritual realm. Goes through the waters of baptism and there was this activity around him. It seemed like there was like this almost opening of the heavens and this dove came upon him, settled upon him, and this booming voice from heaven, God the Father saying, this is my beloved son, whom I love, with him I'm well pleased. His ministry was launched with the supernatural of his father. Said your hierarchical thinking is spiritual immaturity when we leave it to the so called specialists. We all have this responsibility to pursue the power of God and to walk in it. How to make the supernatural world natural? Just a couple of thoughts around this. How to start to embrace it and open ourselves up to it? Number one, accept it and anticipate it. If God said it, if He has chosen to trust us with His power and His glory, then our response is to say, yes, please, Lord. We say yes to what you're saying yes to, to embrace it, to pursue it. We don't run after it. We run after Him. But as we run after Him, we run after what's important to Him. And it is important that the church of God experiences these things and walks in the power of the Holy Spirit. Number two, how to make the supernatural world natural. To see unbelief as a dreadful enemy and to resist it. It's my conviction that the reason the church often is afraid to walk in the power of God is because it's easier to think with unbelief than it, than it is to think with faith. It's like praying for someone in front of you who has an ailment who clearly needs something to happen that's beyond us, our mind, it hurts the mind when you think of that. It shouldn't happen scientifically. It's impossible for that sick person to get better. It's against the laws of nature. And sometimes we just kind of resort to that unbelief. It's impossible for that to happen. And we might even pray prayers, but they come with little meaning and little power. And we need to see unbelief as a dreadful enemy. James 4, 7 tells us how to deal with the enemy. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. What that amounts to, in my understanding of living this Christian life out, is when we feel like God would encourage us to do something or say something and this unbelief comes upon us, you can just whisper this prayer under your breath. I resist the spirit of unbelief. I choose to believe rather in what God says than what the devil says. You can be in a board meeting. And God might show you something about someone or encourage you to do something or say something and you fob it off because of unbelief. And we say, no, I, re I refuse to do that. Lord, if you've said it, then I need to step out and I need to trust you for these things. And thirdly, how to make the supernatural world natural is go and live it. Go and live it. Pursue it. Well, Johnson says persistence is the key to breakthrough. And I believe that. We just keep at it. I know we've spoken about this so often, 
But God wants to give the church courage to go and be the light and the life of Christ. Amen. I'm going to break bread in a few minutes, and I'm going to ask Ian to facilitate for that, uh, us, um, that for us. But I want to end by just showing you two videos of testimonies that happened. Um, both of them happened some time back. And um, I actually, I videoed both these individuals. The one is a lady from Zimbabwe, actually who was part of the church that Ian and Bernie planted in Harare many, many years ago. Her name is Beryl. And she had um, incredible pain in her body and was prayed for and how she received a miracle. And another one was, it happened in Belito, in fact, in um, Tongot some years back. A couple of us would go out onto the streets on a Tuesday afternoon to pray for the sick. And this guy, it, you'll battle to understand his accent, but you'll just pick up a couple of things along the way. Um, we prayed for him, and we saw in front of our eyes how this man was healed. When we got to him, he was breathing quite heavily. In his conversation with us, it was, it was almost like <sighs> breathing fast. And you could see that he wasn't well. And uh, we asked to pray for him. And God miraculously on the streets healed him. And I want to share that just to, um, to grow our faith because testimonies do do that. So if we can have those too, thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Beryl. I live in Zimbabwe. I was healed by the Lord here in this church. I had this problem with the, my right hip that was completely out of uh, sink with the left foot, left eight. When I walked, I had a slight limp. One Sunday morning here in the church, sorry, Saturday night here in the church, they called for healing and the lady sitting next to me, my friend Ray, she said, come Beryl, let's go and get your back healed. And I said, oh, come on. She says, Beryl, let's go. And I walked up with her, she stood behind me and the minister came and stood next to me and he prayed for me and Lord, the Lord fixed me. And I've had no problem since. I've got no pain. I've got two hips that are exactly the same. I'm a new woman. And all I can say is, thank you, Lord. You mentioned you go for walks now. And you don't I, I walk. I can walk anywhere. I, I don't get, pay, uh, get tired from walking. I'm bending up and down. I can pick up children now. Everything has, has changed with me. And it's all through you, Jesus. Thank you. Right. And I was, my back was so, 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 so. And when I saw you, hey, you let me you tell you want to hold my leg. You hold my leg. My back get pinny. And my chest, it went down. It was 10. It came to 8. After five minutes, it came down, down, down. I think now it's four or five or three now. When I'm talking now, I think it's going to finish now. I think it's one now. I don't know when I'm going to sleep at home. Maybe it will finish, 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 finish. As I feel inside my, my chest. Who healed you, General? Who healed you? Jesus. Jesus healed you. Jesus Amen. Healed. Amen. Have you been very sick? Tell us what's been. Tell us what's been happening. I was very sick. My chest was making ha 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 ha. I said I was going down. Now I can make it ha ha ha. Now. Amen. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.